As the prevalence of deep fakes continues to rise, researchers at the Universities of California at Berkeley and Southern California are working to create new techniques that would help detect them. So they've built an AI system that is trained to identify facial movements, tics, and expressions. And therefore, they can determine what videos are actually real. So joining us to explain how the software works and his hope for stopping the spread of deep fakes is Hani Farid. He's the senior advisor for the Counter Extremism Project and is a professor at UC Berkeley, specializing in digital forensic, image analysis, and human perception. Professor, welcome. Good to be here. Well, I'm glad you could join us. You are the preeminent expert on deep fakes, as far as I can be concerned. Washington is very is very concerned about it for political reasons, but it doesn't just begin there, right? It could really change the fabric of the internet itself. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, mm. we, we should recognize that we've had the ability to manipulate images and videos and audios for a long time, but this latest deep fake technology is a game changer for two reasons. One is the level of sophistication and realism that can be achieved now, and two, and perhaps more importantly, is the democratization of access to that technology. You can mm -hmm. literally go online and either for free or for a few bucks, download this very powerful uh, technology and create your own versions of deep fakes that can be used to disrupt uh, elections, mm -hmm. can be used to sow civil unrest, can be used to create non-consensual pornography, um, can use for fraud. And all of a sudden, we're going to be in a landscape where it's going to be hard to believe anything that we see or hear. And I think you're right that the folks here on Capitol Hill are concerned about that from everything from a national security front down to their own elections mm -hmm. that they'll be having in the coming years. Well, you were just telling me about a particularly disgusting technology. What, what it only costs $50, it can render any any female photo that you yeah. upload into non-consensual pornography? It, it's, and I'm not yeah. going to give you the name of it because I yeah, don't want to no, encourage please. people we to go download not. it. Yeah, yeah, um, right. But yes, uh, for 50 bucks you can download yeah. the software uh, and it will take an image of a woman, mm -hmm. and only a woman, uh, and it will essentially remove their clothes and render them nude. And I think there's something deeply troubling about yes, this. True. And I understand that folks on the free speech side will say, well, there's a free expression issue. But you also have to think about the harm to the individual depicted. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, this is not just movie stars. This is anybody who right. has posted an image of themselves online. And so suddenly, we're in a landscape where everybody has posted images of themselves online. And they all now have exposure to this type of technology. So what do we do about it? Well, a couple of things. So first of all, I think those that are creating these technologies, and many of them whom are my friends, by the way, and our fellow mm -hmm. academics and researchers, have to start thinking more carefully about how their technology is being weaponized. They have to start thinking if it is the case that the best thing that they should do is post their code online for free. Right. Um, and I'm not saying they should or they shouldn't. I'm just saying we have to start having a dialogue. Um, well, I'll say it, they shouldn't. Okay, yeah. good. I, I agree with you, but yeah. I'm also an academic and I'm right. sensitive to these issues. But let's at least start talking about it uh -huh. and start thinking about how do we put those safeguards in place, number one. Number two is uh, our legislators have to start thinking about how to regulate in this space. Uh, the wild, wild west of the internet has been going on for far too long, and we have to start thinking about it. So uh, there is actually a bill making its way through the state of California. There is talk about here on Capitol Hill about legislation that would create anything from civil to criminal penalties for the creation of non-consensual pornography. I fully recognize that there are First Amendment issues and we should have serious conversations about that, but I also recognize that there's legitimate harm to the people here. So I think our legislators are going to have to get their head around what the technology is, where is the technology going, and how do you regulate in this space? And I think we have to do that sooner than later because I've been saying now for over a year, this technology is moving fast, right. faster than anything we have seen in the past, and we have got to get out ahead of it. Well, that's the problem. Washington moves at a snail's pace, but that's not how the internet works, and it's been a disconnect in our society for so, quite some time. Would the specifics of those legislation actually do anything? I mean, penalizing a YouTube or a Facebook for identification purposes, I mean, and honestly, I say this as somebody, I am deeply invested in technology, why is this even allowed? Just ban it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, just criminalize it. Be like, you are not going to, you are yeah. not going to undertake this practice in the United States. There, there's a couple of things, and you yeah. just said it in the United States. Right. It's a big world out there, and mm -hmm. the internet is not bounded right. by our, our regions. So let's say we regulate it. Let's mm -hmm. say we make it illegal. Difficult issues. What do we do about the six and a half billion other people in the world? Right. So well, I. Well, then a YouTube compliance department ah, would be responsible for saying right. you can't view this because you're in the U.S. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think that's the interesting question is is that so there's two ways of dealing with this issue. One is a legislative criminal mm -hmm. civil penalties, but the other is just terms of service. Yeah. Because YouTube and Facebook, for example, they ban adult pornography. 
So if they have banned adult pornography, surely we can agree that mm -hmm. this type of non-consensual pornography. But now the issue is you can't just ban it. You have to actually do something about it. Right. You have to aggressively police your platforms, and that is where the platforms have fallen down over the last few well, years. Well, they're not going to do that unless they're going to face some criminal penalty. I mean, you, you said your counter-extremism project. We know Twitter did nothing on ISIS until the government and Congress really stepped up that's, the meter, and then the compliance departments right. got involved. Yeah. I think there's yeah. two pressure points. Yeah. Um, you can start uh, heavy, heavy fines uh, the way we have started doing here and the way the EU has, mm -hmm. um, And but you really want to know where the pressure point is? It's advertisers. There are 20 CEOs in the world that can overnight make Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter change by saying, we no longer will advertise on your platforms until you clean it up. Mm -hmm. Clean up the internet, just tell the advertisers right. for three months, six months, stop advertising. Watch how smart they get and watch how fast they respond. So That's I think the pressure point. has to come from multiple directions, not just the legislative are side. Are you working in the private sector? Anybody on working to, to do that? We are yeah. talking with uh, folks in various NGOs mm -hmm. and, and think tanks trying to sort of help figure out how to navigate. Because it is a complex space, and you do want to be careful about First Amendment and free expression issues. And as you said, when the legislation does act, it is often too slow, right. too late, and everything gets watered down by the, the army of lobbyists. So I prefer to solve this in the private sector. I prefer to get the tech companies to mm -hmm. do this. Um, just do the right thing. Uh, and what I've never, I've been baffled by is not only is it the right thing to do, it's good for you. It's yeah. actually good for you in the long run. And so I think we just have to keep putting pressure both from the public, from the press, from the advertisers, and threats of legislation and penalties. And the hope is we can start to corral what is the mess of the internet right what now. What is the positive argument for this technology? <laughs> I, I really like, yeah. with some of this stuff, I get it. Yeah. There's, you know, this, but I, I there's no good, yeah. no good can come from this. It's the right question like, to ask, yeah. of course. And I think with any technology, we should recognize there's good and bad. Yeah. And now your question is, what is the relative weight of these? Mm. Okay, so let's talk about why, I mean, look, the people developing this technology are not doing it no, for this no. reason. We understand but that. But it's very much like that Jurassic Park thing. It's like you spend right. so much on whether you could, you yeah. didn't ask whether should. you should. That's the right question. Yeah. So like, there are, look, the Hollywood studios clearly love this technology right. because you can do uh, things like put yeah. any actor into any movie. Uh, you can uh, lip sync somebody speaking a foreign language. Right. So there's really cool special effects, but that's a pretty small, <laughs> yeah, a niche that's a technology small win right there, right. for <laughs> a big loss in yeah. terms of the creation of non So that was the genesis of the development. Of course it was. It was always been in that space, okay. right? And, yeah. look, and there's creative things you can do with the technology, absolutely. But once you recognize, which we now do, that this can be weaponized, now you have to start thinking very carefully. When a biologist develops a deadly virus, mm -hmm. they don't say, well, let's put it out there and see what happens. Right. There are, you have to be careful with these things. And I think for a long time, the tech sector has been very much open, open, open. And that has been very good for the last 20 years. But we have now seen the dark side of technology. And we have to start contending with those issues and teaching things like cyber ethics to our young students so that when they do get into the market, they have a scaffolding on how to think about these issues. So how, how is the receptive? Is, is the tech community right now receptive to this slide of thinking on deepfakes? No, absolutely okay. not. Um, and I think, frankly, we're still reeling from everything from child sexual abuse to right. terrorism to misinformation and the deep fakes is just adding on to it. So I think, frankly, the tech sector is overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, largely, I don't have a lot of sympathy because it's of their own making. They created this mess without safeguards in place and now they have to contend with it. Um, I think a lot of academics are pushing back against anything that can be perceived as restrictions. I don't think of it as restrictions. I just think of it as being thoughtful on how you develop uh, and deploy and make available your technology. And I think it's a relatively small ask given what we now see is clear threat. These aren't, these aren't abstract notions, right? We see how this technology more often than not is being weaponized against women. Right. And so I think we have to now start taking that more seriously. I think it really does come down to when you can't believe your own eyes and ears, then you can't believe anything. Well, that's and, exactly and, the fear. And, and I mean, we, we could get to a point in a, f a matter of years, just three years, yeah. in which you can't believe anything on the internet. Here's, here's yeah. to give you a sense of how fast the landscape has changed. Yeah. Two and a half years ago, then candidate Trump is heard saying some awful things on that Access Hollywood yeah. tape. Nobody thought at the time to say it was fake. Everybody apologized. Mm. Does anybody t today think that he wouldn't say it was fake news? Of course he would. Yeah. And not only that, he would have plausible deniability. Yeah. Because we now have the ability to synthesize audio in a person's voice by simply training the system on what that person sounds like. Yeah. And so I think you're right. This plausible deniability is a huge threat to our democracy. Because if everybody can have their own facts, 
I don't know how you have democracy. And you can imagine how this can really rip through society when every time an event happens, we are disagreeing on what actually happened and who said what. So it's not just the, the threat of the actual fake. It's what is the ripple effect when we can't believe anything we see or hear online, which already we're having trouble with just the fake news phenomenon. Inject into that deep fakes, and I think it takes it to a different level. So final question for you. Beyond the legislation, beyond all of that, is it just a general awareness in the public that this is that this is a thing? Yeah. Is that what is most necessary yeah. right now? I, I think that's a yeah. big part of it is education. Yeah. And I'm a professor, yeah. so I, I'm keen on educating, yeah. and I think that's a big part of it. I think the other thing we have to start thinking about is how do we move towards more trusted content? And I think there are things that I would ask of the platforms, but there's things I can also ask of the public. So for example, in the image and video space, there are so-called control capture systems, where you record with a special app, it extracts a signature from your content, cryptographically signs it, and puts it on the blockchain, mm -hmm. a distributed immutable ledger. Yes. And from any point after that, you can authenticate the content. And so we can start That's to shift the burden on the user to right. say, I want my, my content to be trusted, so I'm going to use these control capture apps. They're publicly available now. Um, and that, therefore, I'm going to be valued more because I'm creating trusted content. So I think mm -hmm. we have to attack it from both sides, from the creation side and from the uh, consumption side. That's a really interesting point there. And and why, how blockchain technology really An actual knows no bounds. Yeah, exactly. actually, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Doctor. We really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Yep. We'll have more rising for you after this.